Welcome to Good Game, your no BS insights for crypto founders. Let's fast forward 10 years from now, and let's say every app is built on layer three. I'm just hypothetically thinking about it. And it turns out we're getting millions of users using layer threes now, but no one knows about it, right? The pain that you and I went through is the, what I call growing pains of going through this process. And as in industry crypto users from the start, you and I are complaining about this shit all the time. But if you can get to millions of users at the end of the day by layer threes, so be it. I'm trying to steal man's argument here. I, I know you're a steel, steel man. Yeah, okay. But deep inside, you're, you're dying. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the, the amount of pain you went through yourself. Really? No, I 100% agree. But looking for your next startup idea in crypto? Check out our request for startups list and get inspired at alliance.xyz forward slash ideas. Welcome to Good Game. Uh, we took a one week hiatus. Um, Chow uh, recently had a baby boy. Congrats. Thank you. How, how are you feeling? You, how do I feel? Yeah. I feel I'm, I'm recovered. Last week I was stressed, um, changing diapers all night. But this week I got four grandparents helping out. That's amazing. Yeah, I know it's tough, but uh, also exciting at the same time. Healthy baby. Uh, healthy baby, that's good to hear. Healthy baby, that's the most, most important thing. Poops a lot, eats a lot, sleeps a lot. It's good. On, the, on a side note, or maybe switching topics here, uh, we currently went through a rebrand. <laughs> and uh, the rebrand, I think, was a lot of time in the making. Um, when we first launched Good Game, we launched it as a, as a pilot, if you remember. And so we did the branding. Uh, it took us maybe, I don't know, 48 hours maximum. We didn't put a lot of thought to it. And so um, the more I started looking at our PFPs and, uh, and our branding, the more I felt like it wasn't, it was too boomer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Oh, you know, after I put on this new uh, PFP that we just created, I got like three people asked me what, what NFT collection that, that was. Yes. What kind of day? Yeah, same. And I feel like we're on, on brand now with uh where crypto is at today uh and the, uh, the 70 iq part of yeah. the cycle yeah i like it so yeah if you have any feedback on our branding just hit us up on our telegram chat but a lot has happened as usual <laughs> um blackrock recently launched um their tokenized fund mm -hmm. um there's been a lot of talks about how ethereum is becoming the institutional chain mm -hmm. uh you uh, put out a thought, uh, like a an interesting tweet that said that well, BlackRock could could launch its own L two as well, right? Mm -hmm. I could see a narrative for that, for them to do that. Yeah. Well, first of all, let, let's recap. What what is BlackRock doing? Uh, yeah. They are doing a on chain U.S. Treasury fund. Yeah. And as of today, uh, we can share the uh, the EtherScan address. But as of yeah. today, there's uh, one hundred million dollars. A hundred. Yeah, 100 million. 100 million. So nine figures. Exactly 100 million in this address, uh, BlackRock Digital Asset Fund. They got $400,000 in airdrops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's, Imra, do you, you want to show the user scan? Do you have yeah, it? I'll, I'll, I'll share my screen. All right, so $400,000 in airdrops. But uh, yeah, let's, let's look through... Um, what BlackRock would see. They got uh, $50,000 in Leo X token. What the hell is this? I have no clue. Galileo Protocol. Credo? Okay. I've heard of Credo. Interesting. I forgot what it is. Okay. But there is uh, a Shiba Inu Mog. These I know. Shiba Inu Mog. N not Shiba, Shina. Shina. Okay, okay. Pepe. $1,000 worth of Pepe. Not bad for some free advertisement. Jesus Coin. Don't know what that is. Frax, that's a real coin. That's the OG DeFi protocol. Harry Potter, Obama Sonic. And oh, he has, uh, they got exactly 420.69. <laughs> so, so how, how do you think uh, Larry Fink is looking at this and feeling? <laughs> He's like, <laughs> I don't know. He's like, what the fuck are these wrong with these crypto guys? <laughs> Um, Pepe Fork, Kramer Coin, Pussy Noodle. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. We're not serious people, Chow. I've just realized that. 
I tried to take myself serious at times. And I realized after uh, watching all the shit coins pump over and over again and the types of shit that pumps, I'm like, we're not serious people. That's right. Um, but yeah, that was fun to do. But but what do you think is the impact of, of, of this? Not, not the, not the shit coin airdropping, but, but BlackRock launching their tokenized fund on chain on Ethereum. I mean, because the, the day, the day um, BlackRock announced this in conjunction with uh, Coinbase, I saw all the RWA tokens pump like 50%, 100% the next day, including Ondo. Ondo is now at like $10 billion at BD. Pretty crazy. Yeah. I mean, I think it's very clear that uh, Larry Fink had mentioned this many times, but the ability to access its product, give its access to products across the globe is one area of opportunity, right? Right now, between the KYC and other layers of friction, it's very hard for them to reach customers globally. It's primarily people that are based in the US mm -hmm. or investment managers, et cetera. Like one power that he'd always talked about is the ability to reach the masses. And so that was one area of opportunity he mentioned. He also mentions uh, speed. Um, well, you're, you're saying Larry things talk about this? Yeah. Well, I, generally about crypto. Okay. Uh, he talked about reach, speed, and cost reductions. Those were like the three things yeah. that he talked about. Yeah. Um, and so I do think there's going to be a really pretty big impact whereby we're going to start to see more products on chain. And we're going to start to see people outside of the US uh, invest in these types of products. And we do see this from a uh, institutional perspective, but the everyday retail person, I think is going to be important. I mean, I think you and I talked about this too previously, which is I have family in India, right? And you're like, oh, how do I invest in real estate in India? Yeah. No, there isn't an ability to do that right now, right? Unless you have, you know, many firms that you work with across the board that can do this, but being able to do this completely on chain permissionlessly, I think is where the power is. Yeah. Actually, Ando tweeted about this the other day. They said that uh, there's now $1 billion of U.S. treasuries on chain already. So a small part of that is uh, Ando itself. So Ando has a uh, U.S. treasury product. And then the remaining, the ballpark, the bulk of it is from other products. I've seen like Centrifuge, Block Tower, like those guys tokenizing um, U.S. treasuries on chain. But I think that's only the first part, the first step. Because in the whole world of RWAs, we start with uh, U.S. dollar. That's stablecoin. That's the first step. And the most natural next step is to tokenize U.S. Treasuries. It's the asset that's closest to U.S. dollar. It's, U.S. Treasury is basically U.S. dollar plus some interest rate. Yeah, short term interest rate. And now the question is, what is the next natural next step? What is the and, next asset to tokenize? Uh, to me, it's U.S. stocks and U.S. real estate. These are some of the most high quality assets that everyone around the world, everyone outside of the U.S. want access. So our, our colleague, David, he was in China uh, two months ago, and basically he did some underground study of mm -hmm. what Chinese consumers wanted. Like everyone wanted U.S. stocks because Chinese stocks are, have been down only not for, have been down only for 15 years, while the Chinese economy has been up only for 15 years. Yeah. So in China, the, the stock market doesn't reflect the economy, whereas in the U.S. it's the opposite. The U.S. economy has been doing well, but not like 10% per year, whereas the U.S. stock market has been doing 10% a year. But isn't that a function of, well, the, the Chinese communities would prefer investing in real estate over stocks, whereas in the U.S. it's stocks over real estate. Is that true? I think there is part of that, yes. Okay, so right now, Ethereum, for the past, let's say, a few years, Ethereum was the go-to chain to build products for crypto. Now what's happening is, Layer twos are taking away that business and Solana and layer one and layer ones. They're taking away that business. Now, Ethereum is just kind of a, a chain where maybe people launch like test products. I don't think that's true anymore, but you hardly see anyone launching on Ethereum anymore. So it's kind of a quote unquote ghost town. Even if you look at the Ethereum NFTs, ghost town, like no one's buying, no one's really selling. It's kind of dead. And now it's positioning itself as kind of a temporary blob space as an example. Uh, and now we're starting to get institutions that are building or these types of tokenized funds on ETH layer one. What do you think is the future of Ethereum then? Is it just going to be used as a a settlement layer, right? And security layer, and then primarily targeting institutions? I'm not sure. I'm I'm trying to... You, you remember Vitalik wrote, uh, published a blog post like two weeks ago about where he showed a, an S-curve 
of where Ethereum is on, yes. the, on the scaling roadmap. Yes. And he said that where Ethereum is well past the middle of the S curve. Okay. Ethereum is, is past the, the hyperscaling phase. It's now in the sort of the maturing phase in terms of scaling effort. And I was uh, somewhat disappointed to see that. Yeah. Because what, what, it's, what it's telling me is we're not really expecting to see much more meaningful scaling on the layer one, at least yeah. not compared to the last few years. So, uh, you know, on the Ethereum layer one, the fees are continue to be very expensive. Like, yeah. I haven't used the layer one in a very long time. I tried to use it. It's like 80 bucks to do a swap or 80 bucks to, to, to send a, a transaction, not even a swap. Swap is even more expensive. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just going to be a settlement layer for layer twos. Yeah. From one on. I'm disappointed too, uh, if you ask me. Um, I really wanted to see Ethereum compete, uh, yeah. you know, make more EIPs that are maybe even competing with layer twos. Yeah. That's the type of Ethereum that I wanted to see. You remember on our episode with, uh, with Mert, yeah. he, he said something that, that really struck me, which is that Ethereum is uh, making a, a premature optimization in the sense that Ethereum hasn't reached the, the hasn't explored fully the, the potential of the layer one yeah. and is now focusing on layer two scaling. Yeah. Layer twos are going to happen on, on Solana as well, but Solana is trying to reach the full potential of the layer one before going up the, the layers. Okay, so what is the role of a layer one then, right? If layer two is bound to happen, which we talked about on Solana and, and every other layer one that's out there, because there's no other way to really scale, what does that make in a layer one? Is it just going to be a layer for security uh, okay. and settlement? It, it's, is that the price? And that's fine, right? And it's only for settlement. It's not even for data availability. Yeah, well, that's gone too. We are using yeah. Lysia and uh, I, Arbitrum. Uh, what's the, any, uh, any trust? Any trust, yeah. yeah. I would trust any trust for, for data availability. Because the data availability on layer one is too expensive. Yeah. So data's gone. I mean, you have temporary data now, but it's only good for like, you know, useless transactions. Yeah. Um, I, I guess that's, that's what it is, right? I mean, even if you look at Bitcoin, like people are building around the Bitcoin ecosystem. What is it used for? It's just used for, for settlement. Yeah. Trust. Did we talk about uh, uh, proto-dank charting on our last pod? The la- our last pod was two weeks ago. Did we actually talk about it? We didn't go deep into it, but we talked. We've talked about this a few times in many of our episodes Be- before it happened, right? We, we have more happened. The- no, we didn't talk about post uh, where we tested out the fees. I know you tweeted about yeah. this a few times. Yeah, let, let, let's talk about the, the fees because I've been using Bayes and Optimism uh, pretty much every day since uh, since uh, Proto Dank Sharding went live. Dankun or yeah, Dankun, right? Well, what's up with these terms? <laughs> Dankun. <laughs> Uh, what does it stand for again? Denver and uh, Cancun. Cancun. No, that's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Cancun, uh, where proto tank sharding happened. Yeah, uh, which created this block space on the layer one, yeah. uh, which helps with data availability for layer twos. Uh, so the theory is uh, layer two fees would go down dramatically, and it did. So it did by at least one or two orders of magnitude, depending on the chain. Not every layer to activate it at the same time, but but you can look at the the, fee, the the chart of the fees across various layer twos. You can see very clearly when the layer two activated proto dank sharding, and depending on the chain, went down one or two orders of magnitude. Very impressive. Um, so I, I've been using op, a base and optimism every day for the last couple of weeks, and what I experienced was in line with the data. However, there's uh, one thing. That I noticed that wasn't that, that wasn't reflected in the data, which is that the variance in the fees were very high, was very high on base, for example. So on some days I make a swap, it's three cents, two cents, which is in line with Solana, for example. On other days, it can go to eight dollars when well, the chain is really congested. That makes Solana, sense. I never see that. Solana is always one or two cents. Well, it makes sense. Why? Because you know, Ethereum is a shared blob space, right? Where people all the layer two share that. Yeah. So depending on what layer two uses it the most, they have to kind of like compete for that space yeah. and time, right? And cost. Well, uh, what, you're, what you said is correct in theory, but empirically, that's not what's happening. What's right happening? now, the block space is not the bottleneck empirically. 
the bottleneck right now is the execution of the layer twos. Okay. So and, and that is the difference between single threaded and parallel execution. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, layer twos like Bayes and Optimism, they're not using parallel uh, execution. Yeah. So and and that is, that's where the bottleneck is today. So yeah, and Bayes transactions, Bayes TPS went up by an order of magnitude since Dancun, but that creates a, a lot of uh, load on, on the execution environment. So for those that are trying to understand single threaded. Uh, and parallel threaded or dual threaded. Um, essentially, what it means is, you know, you're waiting for one sequence of transactions to complete, and your and your transactions waiting in line to be executed. Whereas with parallel execution, you have two lanes where you can execute transactions. So if, yeah, yeah so that's pretty much at high level. And we well, go I want to put something button. into a context, which is very important. Which is, yeah. I see a lot of misinformation on Twitter from the debate debates between the ETH maxis and, and the Sol maxis, which is that. Uh, yes, on average, the base fees and optimism fees, and arbitrum fees are on par with the Solana fees. That is true. But there's several big caveats. One is, as I said, the variance is very high on base and optimism. And this is from just me using the products. That's number one. Number two, and this is going to suck for all the ETH maxes listening to this, which is that the, the, the total number of TPS combined across all the layer twos today is one order of magnitude lower than Solana. Like, think about it. Yeah. Solana processes one or two, one to 2,000 transactions per second. The best, the most, the busiest uh, Ethereum layer 2 processes 10 to 20 per second. And there's maybe like 10 of them that really matter. So together, they process maybe 100 TPS. All the Ethereum layer 2s together, 100 TPS. That's one order of magnitude lower than Solana. And th that's number two. Yeah. Number three, Yes, Ethereum layer one is more decentralized than Solana, but the Ethereum layer twos are nowhere near the level of decentralization as, as Solana. They use sing single sequencer, single sequencer, number one, and two, the proofs are not permissionless. Uh, only, I think yes. the only arbitrum is stage two layer two. If you look at the L2, L2 beats, stage one, yes. sorry, stage one, not, not stage, stage one. Yeah. Only arbitrum one is stage one layer two decentralization. Um, and everyone else is at state zero. Exactly. Yeah. So, and remember, the more decentralization you add, the the more latency you add. So, like, if you were to decentralize a sequencer set, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm sure there could be ways to work around it, but typically, when you decentralize, because right now you have a single sequencer, right? And if you have if you decentralize a sequencer set, then you have you know a few sequencers you have to coordinate and figure out what transactions you want to publish on the blockchain. The conclusion I have really is that purely from a tech point of view, Ethereum is really behind Solana. It is actually 10x behind. And this is something that I think a lot of ETH maxes don't want to admit. Look, ETH is still ahead of Solana in terms of developer mind share, in yep. terms of TVL, in terms of liquidity, in terms of probably you actually Ethereum is behind in user count already. It's ahead in all these things that I just mentioned, but pure tech wise, Ethereum is behind. And trading volume, you know, on DeFi, Solana is already on par with Ethereum. Okay, so there's obviously first movers advantage, right, with Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum kind of architected the smart contract space, uh, and so they have mind share, they have developer share, you know, incredible ecosystem. And a way, like before they before they went from sharding to like layer twos, you know, there was a big debate whether sharding or layer twos would be the right approach. They decided layer twos. They allow mm -hmm. others to commercialize the the next layer up. That would enable more apps to be built. And it turns out even that has a threshold, right, of price, right? I mean, even with layer twos, it seems to me that it it's not as competitive with uh, Solana in terms of fees, right? It's there, but it's not all the way there. Right. Uh, and now what we're seeing is layer threes. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I know it's. You it's funny. On our last pod, on our last pod, I was like. I'm not, gonna talk about layer yeah. I'm not going to talk about layer threes. But well, with Degen we hitting two billion dollars, I think we might have to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. right. Um, well, so Degen just went up. Degen the token just went up hundred uh, x. Yeah. To uh, two billion dollars in market cap. Yeah. Um, do Do you want to talk about it? Do you want to talk about the you know what yeah, happened? I mean, what is Degen and what happened? You know all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, Degen's been around. It was one of the first communities on Farcaster to tokenize. Um, 
And uh, we talked about this in our Dan Romero's podcast, if you remember. And towards the end of the conversation, you and I said, you know, we could see a world where channels could launch their own tokens Mm -hmm. and kind of bootstrap from there. Um, And it actually turned out it was true. Not only that, but it became kind of the go-to-market strategy to grow the Farcaster community as well. There was a DJN channel, right? There was a DJN channel. And you launched like in December, I believe? Yeah. The, the channel and the token I think in it, Yeah, somewhere in the early days of Farcaster. I forgot what, okay. what month it was. Okay. Um, but there was, if you remember, the, uh, uh, Far, the Farcaster community launched points first. And points, you know... I think they were still trying to figure it out of what these tokens, like how would, they would launch these tokens, the community, the whole nine yards. But mm-hmm. the idea was to foster some sort of engagement to bring more users and, and community and more people to get together in, in the Farcaster yeah. community. Yeah. So points, I remember that because, uh, you know, I, I saw that and I thought it was pretty on brand with kind of like the base Farcaster community. Yeah. Um, then uh, we saw DGen and uh, DGen just kept, uh, the price kept going up. Yeah. Um, well, so in, in December, so I, I I've been using Farcaster for like yeah more than half a year, like consistently. And in December, uh, I remember seeing like w- whenever I cast something on Farcaster, sometimes I, I get a, a tip in the yes. form of DJN, like three hundred DJN, three hundred DJN, that kind of stuff. I didn't know what it was. I s- sort of knew that it was some kind of tipping, but when I tried to claim it, uh, the, the DJN token didn't exist. It, it wasn't a real token. It was like uh, some points in a centralized database. Uh, but later, that thing did become a real token that that was on chain, and that is the DGen token today. That just went to uh, like two billion dollars. I, I haven't, I still haven't claimed my my tokens yet, but it's probably worth a lot now. Yeah, haven't. So I, I've been just nonstop casting and, and receiving some some tips. So that was the first utility of the DGen token. Like, the, so DGen token is it started off as a meme coin, I suppose, but People started using the token to tip each other. Yep. That was the, the first utility for this token. Very similar to Bunk, by the way. Bunk started as an ecosystem. Point, and then yeah. They built like Bunk Bot and that kind of stuff. Um, so that, that's sort of the, the high level of the DGen token. But yep. this week, they also launched the Layer 3. <sighs> yeah. Um, so there's a company um, called Syndicate. They provide like infrastructure tooling for developers. Mm-hmm. And uh, they got together with uh, Arbitrum, Base, and Decent, which is the Decent and Conduit. And they ended up building this kind of like out of the box layer three. What's solution. Decent? Decent, uh, they're a bridge. Okay. They just provide bridges. And between kind of that stack, they were able to build a integrated mini rollup or a layer three, whereby that rollup uses Base as a settlement layer. Mm hmm. And uh, you know, and Arbitrum AnyTrust, and, and Arbitrum AnyTrust as a DA layer, and Decent as a bridging layer, and the native token for this layer three is De- uh, is um, Degen, also. Yeah. So that was one and of the. That mean you pay gas using the Degen token. Degen token. That's right. And then you also have Dracula, which is a, a social app that uses Degen as a uh, payment layer mm, for okay. that. For this. So there's even more. There's two more sources of utility for the token now. Yeah. One is as gas token for the layer three, and then Dracula using it as payment. There's probably more. There's probably more. There's probably more. Yeah. But this is kind of interesting, right? You know, using a token as a way to bootstrap. Uh, if you look at Farcaster, the way it started was just purely people coming together under one topic. Degen, there's other channels that are out there like MFR, right? which we can talk about. They launched a token too. Yep. Um, and others, and we'll talk through all of that, but just people getting together and they believe in a certain topic and they started to, you know, airdrop these tokens, use these tokens to tip each other. And that kind of got mindshare. And from that mindshare, they used it as a way to uh, help bootstrap an app called Dracula. And then they used it as a way to launch its own layer three. And now there's apps that are quote unquote being built on Degen uh, layer three, and uh, we'll see where it goes from there. But it's an interesting bootstrapping mechanism. Did you use the product, the the Degen layer three swapping and sending? No. Okay. I put a tweet out because uh, I saw a lot. I'm in a bunch of Telegram chats, and a lot of people got rugged. <laughs> it was same as Bald. I mean, Base. If you remember, 
when we, every new chance. Every, every layer two, layer three, the, the first thing that happens is that you get run, right? Yes. It's like <laughs> the right, the pathway. You have to get indoctrinated, right? <laughs> um, and so I'm like, fuck this. I, I've been through this way too many times. I'm yeah. just going to wait. Um, and, um, but yeah, people ended up getting, uh, 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 almost every token rug. And there's a couple that are pretty decent. Uh, I think one that Ansem talked about was um, Harold. But besides the point, I haven't, I haven't bridged there yet. Okay. Have so, you? I, I did. Look, when I first heard the term layer three, I was extremely annoyed. I just, I'm, I'm just annoyed by the constant creation of new jargons. But I said to myself, okay, I'm going to keep an open mind. I'm yeah. going to try this and, and, and feel, feel the magic or the pain as a user. So I yeah. used the product. I bridged some tokens to uh, DGN layer three on their official website. Did some swaps on DGN swap mm-hmm. and then send, send some tokens. It, What's the cost? The cost was basically zero. And by, by zero, I don't mean one cent. I mean like one hundredth of a cent. So, so basically the fees went from, so base, base layer two, the fees on base layer two is like one, two, three cents on a good yeah. day, right? Mm-hmm. And with a layer three, basically you remove 99% of that. You reduce the, the, the yeah. layer, layer two fee by 99%, if not more. So it's basically free. That was the positive. The negative was the double bridging. <laughs> You have to bridge not only once but twice. Yeah. So with a layer two, you bridge first to the layer two. You're done. With the layer two, you bridge to the layer two and then to the layer three. Arbitrum solved this, by the way. Um, they're they're trying to they, solve it. They just saw. I think they just solved it, or they're oh, planning to launch two. a product very soon. Okay. But the idea is to bridge directly from L1 to L3. But 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 the thing is, bridging from layer one is extremely expensive. It's like yeah. eighty dollars or something. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's for existing users, right? But for new users, they're coming. Okay. New let's users, put it. They, they, bridge, they go directly from Coinbase or another um, centralized exchange to the layer two. But currently, there's no support to go from centralized exchange directly to layer three. But you think, I, I mean, that, has, that will obviously change, right? I mean, with Coinbase supporting base and DGEN. I, you know, I, I thought about this. I said to myself, Okay, this is going to change. But if you really think about it, is it really going to change? Because there's going to be gazillion layer twos and layer threes. Like, put yourself in the shoes of Coinbase. Are well, they, they really can't support all those layers. Yeah. How, how are they going to design the UX in such a way that that shows like 500 different layer twos and layer threes on the UX just for the withdrawal process? Well, you could probably solve this through a wallet. No, no. Well, that, that's what I meant. Like, yeah. Like, how do you design the UX? Yeah, I, I mean, if we're having, if we're just sh- sh- ship posting here and or, or talking openly, I think wallet is one way, and then you know, for any app you log in, it automatically resorts to the RPC node, right? So like, it auto detects the app that you're using, and it automatically changes everything in the background and moves your capital based on what app you're using, as an example. And then Coinbase on the back end or Base on the back end will manage the settlement themselves. But the starting point is the Coinbase wall is Coinbase centralized ex- your account at Coinbase. Well, this, well, I'm sure you saw this, but uh, Coinbase is talking a lot about their its smart account wallet. Why is uh, Coinbase's smart wallet interesting? Well, it does a few things. One is it uh, obviously solves the UX problem. One, two is automatically connects to your Coinbase account, bank account, or credit card, and it lets you spend it on chain instantaneously. And then there's a couple other like anecdotes, but the idea is essentially the on-ramping goes directly on chain, which I think is the biggest problem, right? So if you're using, I don't know, let's say Arbitrum on Coinbase Wallet, you could automatically have your money uh, withdrawn directly to your Arbitrum address. Mm -hmm. And you could do that with, let's say, if you're using Coinbase Wallet and you're using DGEN layer three, then you could automatically withdraw or to your capital to a layer three. Let's assume there there is a solution, there is a nice solution. But the the point is, it creates more work for exchanges, for wallets to support this new thing, right? That, that is layer three. If everything was on one layer, there's no additional work. The users don't care, right? Uh, they, like, okay, here, here's a perfect example, right? When the, the layer three launched, decent launch three days ago, everybody on Twitter was like, oh yeah, I'm going to get the next meme coin. I'm going to buy the, Like they, they just, <laughs> they just YOLO'd in, right? And, uh, you know, I guess... To me, it's, you know, people are going to go, if there's money to be made, they're going to go there. They don't care. I, I 100% agree. If there's money, people will go there. It is really, really painful. It, it is an extra layer of friction. Oh, it is. Yeah. I mean, but. And, and for developers, let, let me read this tweet 
from Saracen, the the guy, the BD guy at uh, Athena. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, let me read this. Like, this is exactly what I've been talking about, talking about on Twitter for for months. So he said, eighty percent of my work now is working around technical challenges of getting Athena on layer twos. It involves coordinating with devs on shards, oracles, bridging, fucking pain. It's almost like it would be better if all the ETH layer twos were just one chain like Solana. Like this whole fragmentation and complexity creates not just more friction for users, but also for developers. That, that, that's the point I've been beating the drum on for, for months. But can this be solved through a wallet? No, no, again, it can be solved. Like there is a solution. Yeah. But, but it's more work. It's more pain for people, for developers and, and users. It can be solved, but it's right. more work. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to see how it plays out. Sometimes I feel like where we are is we're going from, it's like an Overton window, right? Slowly but surely, we started with like where all layer one, all the transactions are on layer one. Then we had to go through research and figure out, okay, well, maybe layer twos are, are the right components. So then we go with that. It turns out we might have to go a step further and go layer threes. Um, but like, if you go, like, let's fast forward 10 years from now, and let's say every app is built on layer three. I'm just hypothetically thinking about it. And it turns out we're getting millions of users using layer threes now, but no one knows about it, right? The pain that you and I went through, right? Is the learning, like, it's the, the uh, what I call growing pains of going through this process. And as in- industry crypto users from the start, well, you and I are complaining about this shit all the time. But if it can get to millions of users at the end of the day by layer threes, so be it. I guess that's what I'm, I'm trying to steal man this argument here. I know you're a steel, steel man. Yeah. Okay. But 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 deep down, you're deep inside. You're you're dying. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the, the amount of pain you went through yourself. Really. No, I I hundred percent agree. But <laughs> but like, what if you and I aren't really that? You know, it doesn't matter. I mean, layer threes happen with whether we like it or not. And it turns out developers find it the easiest way to compete against Solana, and they want to stay EVM aligned, and that gives them millions of users uh, at the end of the day. Does it? But yeah. I guess where are we in this like window, right? It's it's I'm trying to construct this ourselves, uh, myself, just so that I can still mend my 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 arguments and see if there is a way where layer three is as much as I hate it today, could actually be the thing that makes EVM and Ethereum competitive against Solana. Yeah, I don't know, but I I think it's solvable. Yeah. So layer three, Degen. There's Degen. There's another company called Senko. Like I've talked about this in Kyle Samani's podcast. Um, but Senko TV Corp is a is a uh, casino games streaming front tech mm-hmm. uh, on Arbitrum. So they do a bunch of different things. But they also announced a while ago that they're launching a layer three. Okay, uh, and so that's two. There's a company called Zai um, that uh, is, I think, Sobi's company. He's a NFT influencer, but uh, he is building mini rollups for games as well. So it seems to me that that is where the narrative is going next, layer threes. And uh, Sanko and Zai and others are probably going to follow suit with like Degen, I think, uh, in terms of price action. And, and we're also starting to see some interesting things, right? So layer threes can be an EVM. So uh, I've seen some people talk about doing an a, uh, SVM layer mm-hmm. three. That settles on base with uh, any trust DA, mm-hmm. but layer two can also s- support that with uh, uh, what's it called again? Eclipse? Eclipse. Yeah, but it's commoditizing the VMs with layer threes, right? So anyone can build a layer three with any virtual machine, um, and so you could get the power of Solana as a layer three. I'm, I'm just uh, slowly dying inside. I get it. I'm dying too, but it could be that um, it's that one final point where we're dying, where it actually takes off. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I'm steel manning this argument because I do think that as much as we hate layer threes and like, look, people hate it. It's just like, oh, not another roll up, right? Oh, you we- know, it's not. It's not even consensus among the Ethereum community. Like there was, yeah, I'm sure they're pissed too. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the, well, Polygon, the Poly- Polygon, and, and Arbitrum. Polygon, oh yeah, because look, Polygon has its own infrastructure, right? They're they're building out 
CDKs, right? ZK EVM CDKs with their own ag layer that provides asynchronous composability. So they have a whole different stack that they're they're building. And the stack that 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 everyone else is talking about, the layer threes, is outside of the polygon ecosystem. Yeah. You know, I, I'm just uh I'm just kicking myself for for fading DGEN. Yeah. I talked about this thesis about ba- like I've been bullish on base for almost a year now. Yes, so I remember early last year. I've been bullish on base the whole time. And at some point I said because base is not gonna launch a token. I was like, the best index bet on base is probably going to be a, uh, uh, a meme coin. coin. Yes. The, the mascot of, of uh, base. And right. originally, you and I both thought it was going to be bald. <laughs> and it was a. I wish right. it was bald. It's such a good meme. And later, I just uh, I mid curved on. Well, I didn't. It wasn't really mid curving, but I thought it was going to be the, the cat coin. What is, was it? What is it called again? Toshi. Uh, that one did really well. It did okay. It did okay. It's only 200 million market yeah. cap. That one did okay, but it's very clear in hindsight that the shelling point for base is DGEN. Yeah. And I faded it. It's okay. We can't win all of it. Um, yeah. but, uh, but there are others. So, um, you know, personally, I think, uh, if you want to catch a layer three train, then I think there are other layer threes are launching that could give you similar exposure, probably not as explosive as DGEN because DGEN already has a very like strong community. Yeah. But there are some ways to capture that opportunity, I think. Um, but we're seeing a lot of meme coins launch on base now, right? Um, I put a tweet out that talked about the quality of meme coins. The more of a cesspool it is, the more retail adoption there is. Um, I'm starting to see that on base now. Uh, not as extensive as Solana, but I'm starting to see, um, you know, more meme coins uh, going going for the billion dollar mark. Yeah. Um, there's a token called Brett on on base that did 700 million in market cap. MFR, we talked about that. Oh, we didn't talk mm-hmm. about that, but uh, and we should talk about this. But there's a, a token called MFR that probably did like two two hundred million FTV. 160. 160. Okay. You know, in general, I'm I'm surprised that. Uh... There was one or two days in, in, the, in the past week where half of the front page of Dex Screener was base coins. Yeah. It used to be dominated, entirely dominated by Solana, but now it's 50% base, 50% Solana. So then the question is could Solana and base be the retail chain? Could there be two retail chains, base, Solana? Base, obviously, with Coinbase, 75 million registered users, retail, that's one. Solana mm-hmm. for the rest of the world. I yeah. could see that. I could see that argument. The advantage that Base has is the distribution from Coinbase. The users users just get uh, funneled to Base directly from Coinbase because they pay zero fee for bridging to Base. Yeah, they do pay a, a, a on chain gas fee for bridging for bridging to other chains. So that, that's distribution. That's the advantage for Base. The the disadvantage is the fees. Actually, it's still is always going to be the fees. So the Base fees are. On average, on par with Solana, but with a huge variance, huge, yeah. huge variance. Yes, yeah. that's not user friendly. I'm sure they have some upcoming uh, improvement for that, but at the moment, Solana is ahead. Yeah, I also, you know, having used both Base and Solana, just swapping and the slippage is it's painful, man. It's just insanely painful. Painful where on Base? On Base. No, but but th- that can be solved. That that's with well, more- it can be if through liquidity, right? Yeah. But w- what I liked, uh, what I like about Solana is Jupiter, right? With the DCA uh, function, I'm so surprised there's no Ethereum DEX that supports DCA or major DEXs at least. Cowswap does, but you know you have to like deposit assets into a gasless environment and then enables its own. Because the problem is that you have to go. In a ERC or like a four three three seven environment, a construction mm-hmm. environment, to do this, yeah. Um, otherwise, it's painful. So yeah, I agree with you. Like if there was a way where I can just lock some funds into smart contract, the smart contract can execute the transactions on my behalf would be amazing. But yeah, did you see the? Uh, or do you have something you can bring it up? No, I'm I'm just looking at the the other uh, big news. There was a there was a Munchables hack. Oh, Munchables yeah, Munchables. Against um, uh, North Korea. 
Yep. I, I, but I think they debunked that. I don't know if it's really North Korea. Um, I don't know exactly what happened, but I saw some tweets uh, of somehow they uncovered the Anon that, that uh-huh. did the, the hack. Uh-huh. And I think they pretty much made an offer that he couldn't, he or she couldn't refuse, meaning like reporting you to the authorities if you don't give us the money. Okay. So that's how they got the money back from. And it I, wasn't North Korea? It wasn't North Korea. So um, that was uh, one, two days of where all the, everyone came out, started shitting on blast, of course. And then now Pac Man is a hero. <laughs> yep. Don't you love these story arcs? There is a forecaster one billion dollar valuation. Yeah, pretty. Uh, yeah, I mean, like you're comping against. Uh, well, the comp is probably Twitter, right? Elon sale for forty four billion. So, uh, is that by the way? Isn't that bearish for Dgen? Because Dgen is sort of the index bet on forecaster base. Like, do, do you see Dgen as the as an index bet on forecaster or the index bet on base? Or a little bit of both. Both. Okay. Both. So if, um, if and, and, and launches a to- go ahead and social, and right? social. so forecaster social right, um, w- wouldn't wouldn't forecaster launching a token? Oh, uh, first of all, I don't know if forecaster is going to launch a token, but if they do, that would take a little bit of premium away from DGEN, right? Well, yeah, it will. It's definitely going to take a premium away. But you know, maybe the idea here is that the layer three would have its own like ecosystem. And like, I also question, you know, how many times can you replicate an ecosystem on a different chain, right? You have on base, you have Uniswap, you have the liquidity, you have the bridging, et cetera. You have all of these like core components that makes like you could stay on base and not have to worry. But if you go through a, another layer three, right, the liquidity aspect of it is kind of annoying. So I'm curious to see how that builds on its own and how much liquidity it can grab from retails, retail. Yeah. What do you think of uh, Imad Mostaki's fall at uh, Stability AI and his pivot to decentralized AI? Any hot take on that? All right. Um, (laughs) 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 All right. So, you know, I've talked to uh, Imad back in 2019. Um, Smart guy. You know, I don't know him personally. Like, I don't know him as a friend or anything like that. I just talked to him a few times and we riffed on a few ideas in crypto. Then I saw him on the news with Stability AI and doing really well. And uh, I've noticed a lot of news that spoke negatively about him as well. Yeah. Uh, there were people that worked at Stability AI that talked about how Imad mismanaged money, employees, the this future of, of where Stability was going. Uh, recently, he announced that he was stepping down from Stability AI and uh, he was going to focus his efforts on decentralized AI. Mm-hmm. The entire community of uh, entire crypto community was they were ecstatic, welcoming mm-hmm. someone that is going to pump their bags, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, he wrote a, a proposal for render protocol. I didn't go into the details. Uh, I thought it was a, well. I, I read it, but I didn't understand anything. It was a lot of fluff, in my opinion. But uh, yes, the, the render bag holders must be very happy. Look, I mean, like I'm bullish. Over time, with decentralized AI, I just think we're pretty early. But I do worry about one thing, which is uh, I don't know the details of whether or not it's what Imad did is true or not. But it seems to me that the reporting that came out from like Fortune and other um, reputable firms backed it with very specific data points to the point where they counted how many people they interviewed to get the data points, and it was thirty. Did the you firm. get what data points of? The data points about how the capital was mismanaged, how stability AI is burning money. Uh-huh. Um, also, and- the interview the journalist interviewed thirty employees. Yes, that's stability. Yes, yes. Okay. And it turns out from that article that it was he was being negligent. Period. Yeah. To the point where the investors investors like Lightspeed asked him to resign, and he wouldn't yeah. resign. But then we saw this tweet that he left to start to get into decentralized AI, to me, as a person that's cynical, sees this a, as a cash grab opportunity to burn, to get rid of reputation out of one sector and restart with the new sector. Yeah. And this could be a starting of a new main character. You know, you know what that reminded me of? Uh, I was talking to one of our founders who is, uh, among other things, very deep in AI and very deep in decentralized AI. And he told me something 
to the effect of no serious AI person would ever do a startup in crypto. Well, the thing is, like, there's still so much opportunity in the AI, right? Like, why would you go and mesh two things right away? I feel like if you are a, a an AI, like, if, if you're deep into AI, you, your entire work is in AI, you want to continue exploring that, right? Um, and then I think, you know, those that are maybe more crypto native will want to explore these types of like intersections of crypto and AI. I don't know. Well, I've been, I've been dunking on, on AI crypto for the last couple of months. I, I, I thought it was my duty to do it. But you remember a year ago, we were, we actually did a podcast on, on decentralized AI. Yeah. I also went on Bankless to talk about decentralized AI. Yeah. The whole idea does make sense to me. Yeah. But what's happening today is, uh, it's so easy to raise money. The valuations yeah. are being pushed to ridiculous levels, easily billion dollar valuation without a product. Uh, VCs are following into the sector, uh, which in turn attracts a lot of opportunists, mercenary founders. 100%. And again, I wanted to keep an open mind, so I tried a bunch of products. I, I, you know, I, I put together a list of uh, yeah. top, quote unquote, top decentralized AI products. I tried all of them. And guess what? Most of them didn't even work. Can you, you name any names? I'm not going to name okay. uh, names, but it's, it, it, it takes five minutes to try the product and, and you'll see what I'm talking about. You should see the pitches that I'm getting, uh, that we're getting, and they're getting funded. That's the scary part. Seeing people that aren't AI experts that are more, uh, I don't know, maybe crypto natives or, you know, not even crypto. That are coming yeah. in, that are raising money for things that don't really make sense in AI, in crypto. So, like one that I saw was, I don't know, intent based AI infrastructure or something to that extent. AI payments for AI agents. payments for intent modular restaking layer two. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm even having a hard time saying this, is where I'm at, um, because yeah. I can't think of the amount of things that are coming within one sentence, but. Yeah. So I guess this space is very frothy and uh you know I do believe in decentralized AI but I just think we're way ahead of the curve here. Look, th this space is very interesting but by default I currently just view everything as at best a proof of concept, at worst yeah. a total scam. Yeah. And out of all 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 these teams and products, of course there's always going to be good well-intentioned founders building real products. And we made a few investments, like three investments last year. Really good teams. And we're going to make another one soon. So in all of this, there's still some really good gems. There are. But overall, yeah. like for people who are interested in the space, for those who are looking at the coins and just trying to decide whether or not to buy the coins, just by default, assume that the coins are meme coins. At best. You, you know, this is why I like meme coins. I think you put a tweet out, uh, which was something that I was already thinking about, which is... Yeah. You're taking away capital from scammers and you're giving it to, um, <laughs> well, I don't know. If, uh, all right. You're at least giving it to, <laughs> you're giving it to, uh, you know, a meme coin, right? Like the, yeah. the capital is, you know, being siphoned off from scammers or opportunistic people to, you know, meme coins. To me, that feels more f like it's kind of balancing out the ecosystem, right? Yeah. Which is the I'll, retail. I'll about this. There is a bifurcation, the market bifurcation. Yes. Right now. Yeah. Which is with the advent of, of meme coins, the market is now bifurcated into the meme coin sub market yes. and the serious coin yeah. sub market. And the players in these two sub markets are very different. Yes. So the, the serious coin market is basically the VCs and the quote unquote serious people, the, the highbrow, you know, ivory tower people that play the serious coins. The retail, they're fed up with this. They're fed up with the uh, low market cap, high FDV kind of huge supply overhang. They're done with this. And they're done with all these buzzwordy, new, new trendy like projects, right? Like all these jargons that they don't understand. So they're done with the serious coins and they play the ones that they understand, which is the memes. Because memes yeah. is just culture. Like your, your strategy for trading memes is the harder I laugh, the, the more I want to buy. Yes, it's exactly what's happening with the retail as well. So they play this market. And so the VCs and the retail, they're, they're starting to bifurcate. Whereas before 
the, the, this emergence of meme coins, what, what used to happen was the VCs get into the insider deals and then they, the, you know, the coins get listed on, on centralized exchanges like Binance and then the retail buy the bags. So the retail was always the exit liquidity for, for, for VCs. It was PVE for VCs. VCs being the player and retail being the environment. It was easy mode, PVE mode for VCs. But now the retail don't want to play anymore. They bifurcate. Yeah, very good explanation. And um, I think uh, Zika, uh, Zahir from Z Capital mentioned this as well, which is that we're seeing a, um, you know, there are many opportunities in this dark forest of like the VC coins and that it requires a lot of diligence on, on being able to see which ones are the ones that are underpriced relative to where we are in the market. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was also an, another interesting point because now, if you think about it, I, probably millions of coins now at this point. I mean, on Solana alone, there's 6,000 coins that launch every day, um, which is insanity. Yeah. Um, but if you look at like credible projects that are, that uh, have a token that's live, you know, the ones that don't have a narrative, but have really good product are the ones that are underpriced. And so I do think there is going to be a lot of opportunity in the VC, like the VC area is just having to spend a lot more time diligencing and figuring out where the opportunity is and where the narrative is. Yeah. It's interesting because now that it's taking away a lot of the speculative flow, meme coins, I think it's just going to become a very big <laughs> market. Do you think we're actually in a meme coin uh, super cycle? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. For sure. Hands on. We're in a meme coin super cycle. And uh, I mean, look at, look at because this whole thing is not fundamentally different from ICO, but like it's, People frame these things in, in different ways. Like the framing is meme coin versus ICO. But fundamentally, they're the same. Like they're, they're, they're all like vaporware that does nothing that people want to gamble on. And it's the exact same story with NFTs in 20, 2021 as well. NFTs were meme coins yeah. with a high floor price. Like people frame these things differently, but fundamentally, they're the same. So this is a not a real phenomenon. Like XRP or Cardano, these are, these are meme coins from back in the day. People don't think of them as... They were dressed, but they were dressed as VC projects, right? Uh, so, okay, they were memes to okay. us. Yeah. Okay, so like, here's, here's the funny part. I had a friend the other day that was just like, hey man, I heard Hedera just got a license in Dubai. Who? <laughs> Hedera. Hash, uh, what was it? Uh, Hedera hash... Hedera hash... Graph. Hash graph. Hash graph. I'm like, it's a meme. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe they're building something. I don't know, but to you and I, it's a meme, right? So, yeah. but to the, everyone else, they think it's serious. Like they did their diligence. They go on these like, you know, investor group calls where like they're, to me, I, I think they're pump and dump groups. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and then they talk about how the future of this happened in, um, in China with, uh, Cardano. Do you remember that video that went viral? Yeah. Yeah. Where- <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So the thing is, the thing is, Cardano, I think, is actually a meme coin to the people who traded, because Charles Hoskinson is this cult leader. Like people know, I think people know that there's no nothing real there, but they, they just no. love love Charles. Crypto, yes. Crypto natives, yes. But the average person, I've had. Oh, here's another one. So I was at a um at a birthday party like a year ago, and this guy, like this friend of mine, I've known him since high school like a smart guy, like not an idiot, like a smart guy came up to me. He goes, <laughs> and I couldn't stop laughing, but he said, Hey man, I just bought some Cardano. I, I really think, you know, it's the future. And I just bursted out laughing and I laughed and he goes, why are you laughing? I'm like, bro, it's, there's nothing there. It's all vaporware. <laughs> and he got mad at me and he left. <laughs> Um, and I told him like right before that, like just buy Solana instead because that's where you, where you want to be. Yeah. Um, and so I feel like people are taking there's there's these coins that are you know marketed as real products, but they're really not. <laughs> I I'm, don't know. I'm, what I'm, I, I'm, I'm surprised that you still have uh, normie friends because my my friends are e- are either entirely not interested in crypto or pure crypto degens. It's either or. There's no in between. Yeah, all the people that that I am close to are are retail crypto folks. Like meaning that they got it their space where they got dumped on in 2017, but then they still stayed along and um bought some shit coins in 2020 
did well. And they're all in it. They're still all in the trenches. Um, my my non crypto friends, they only buy Bitcoin or Ethereum. It's like, is that from your advice though? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, the the retail people I know, they don't even take my advice. I'm like, I just don't tell them anything really. Uh, yeah. And then they'll ask me, and I'll say whether or not. But but you told them to sell with at thirty cents. Just my family members. No, okay. I told them to buy with at eleven cents. But but you told them to sell at some point a little bit too early, right? Or no? Yeah, around like uh two dollars fifty cents and then i told them to buy back so okay. they bought back okay uh 220 but yes but that's from you you told me to sell <laughs> <laughs> it's over <laughs> um but luckily i told him to buy back um there's one person i didn't buy back and he is it hurts but yeah last thing 25 years for sbf any thoughts um you don't care Frankly, I don't, I don't really care. I don't care. It's, uh, um, two years. No. I, uh, 25 years feels a little bit too little. It's lower than I expected. But it seems lower than expected, but at the end of the day, you know. I, I thought it was going to be a life sentence. I thought it was going to be a life sentence too. He'd probably get out in good 11 years. I think GCR put a tweet out that said that he'll get out in good behavior in 11, 12 yeah. years. And by then, I think everyone will forget or are too rich to care. Yeah. <laughs> so. 10 years, 11 years, um, it is what it is. Like, I don't care. It's time to move on. But uh, yeah, like, I do feel like it's too little. He should be in there for life. But like, Bernie Madoff was life. Yeah. And and it turns out SBF took more money than than Bernie Madoff. Way more. Way more. So to me, I think there's politics involved and et cetera. Yeah. We're introducing a new section called Mailbag, where we have our listeners send us some questions and we'll try our best to to answer some of them. And we have a uh, private Telegram chat where we have some of our listeners where we can kind of talk to to get some of these questions. But the first question was asked by Joe, which is insights on DGen layer three. I think we've given that already in, earlier. Uh, zap Zara app dot ETH or zap Zara dot ETH said, uh, not a lot of people seem to talk about ordinals anymore. What is your take on ordinals? There's so much happening on ordinals. Bullish. Insanely bullish, um, but we're dedicating a, a complete new episode for that, which we're, we, where we'll go deeper into ordinals. But high level, Runes is going to launch uh, in 19 days. It's a protocol that brings fungibility or brings tokens to the uh, Bitcoin ecosystem. And um, that's going to unlock a lot of new use cases. And then we're going to see Bitcoin layer twos and other stuff. So we'll talk more about it, but extremely bullish. Bitcoin is just so interesting. It's it's really the renaissance for Bitcoin. Yeah. yeah. Um, my my very quick thesis for ordinals is just wealth effect. Yeah. Um, the top ordinals today are trading, uh, maybe at twenty percent of the top Ethereum NFTs. Yeah. Just CryptoPunks. At the same time, uh, Bitcoin itself is three times higher than Ethereum. So that ratio will, will close. The gap between the two will, will close. Meaning. Ordinals should reprice to a similar ratio to to Bitcoin as what punks are to Ethereum. Yep, hundred percent. But you know, I guess let, let's talk a little bit about this um, NFTs as a asset class. It seems to me more and more it's challenging my my own like thesis of whether or not NFTs will be a long term thing. Uh, it's because I, of moon coins. Well, the thing is. Um, I, obviously, I still think it's gonna be a very big sector, and we talked about why we're bullish, like four hundred fours and and etc. But every meme coin, or every NFT project now is launching their own token. So recently, MFR uh, airdropped its own token to everyone that's holding MFRs, uh, and we're seeing this meta play across the entire ecosystem. Like Capsules just launched an anime token, as an example. I forgot. There's a bunch of others that. There's a whole list. It of, all started of, with uh, with uh, board apes in the last cycle. Yeah, it started with board apes, but it kind of died there, right? Yeah. The meta restarted with Boom or Book of Meme, because because people now understand the market dynamics. They know that the floor price is too high for retail yeah. to, to buy in, so they need to launch fungible tokens. Which is why we were so bullish four hundred fours, right, to begin yeah. with, because it kind of merges the two together. Yeah. And so this is a new dynamic that's playing out. So we saw we start the, we saw this by the the pre sale phase, right, where these projects would uh, raise an insane amount of money 
and then launch your token. And most of the time, price action outside of Book of Meme and maybe Slurf, everything else kind of died. And then from there, it went to, okay, forget the pre-sale meta because it's only down only. Uh, let's just airdrop everyone a token and you just buy as much as possible early on. And I think that's kind of what happened at MFR and, and others are launching. It's a way to bring liquidity to market, excitement to the market. Like it's much easier to build a community when you have a token than, than an NFT because you can extend that brand across, you know, across the globe easily because anyone can buy into it. Uh, we actually uh, just accidentally answered the question for Q, a flaky pastry. Uh, he, he had this exact question about meme coins versus uh, NFTs. Yeah. So what would be the future of, of NFTs? What is the future of NFTs? I think um, all existing NFTs will launch their own token, similar to like MFR. I think that's what's going to happen. They're going to launch their layer twos. Exactly. Some of them that are very strong brands will have to launch their own layer two. Pudgies. Like if you, exa- if you think about, let's say, um, Azuki's, right? They're launching something called Anime Chain before they got front run by <laughs> Capsule. Um, they ended up taking a ticker on, on base and they launched it yesterday. But Azuki's launching it, so, right? So could there be products built on this chain that would help propagate a- a- Azuki's brand across the globe, right? So like, I don't know, I'm throwing out hypotheticals. Azuki Dex, uh, Azuki, uh, I don't know, social games. I could see this whole like Disney-like environment b- be built on a, its own layer two or layer three or whatever you want to call it. Or layer one. Or layer one. Well, actually, let me take this back. This already is happening. Axie. Axie, right? Incredible brand. Ronin, its own chain. And now there's apps being built on top of Ronin that's bringing an incredible amount of users and growth. Using the, some of which are using the Axie's brand. R- Ronin is, is uh, technically, it's a sidechain. It's a sidechain. So it's- they're trying to get to the point where they're an actual layer two. But yeah, right now they're a sidechain. Yeah. But they should do it just the layer one. I mean, it's just debase. You know, this is the other thing I don't understand about layer threes. Like you debase yourself by going as a layer three. Like the higher layer you go, the mark, the less market, the market appreciates you. The less the market values you. Yeah, that is also true. Um, but really, if you yeah, ask it me, it doesn't make sense to me to be honest. But listen, Chow, let me ask you this. I mean, okay, when you're building Web two. You spin up a what an AWS server, AWS server, right? And it, I mean, it's commoditized, right? I think we're going through the commodity phase of of layer twos and layer threes to the mm-hmm. point where the more you bring on, the less value we hold to these layer twos and layer threes. And really, it's the products that are being built on top that brings in the value for the layer twos and layer threes. Mm-hmm. The market skewed too much towards infrastructure that we forget that really. The, what brings the value is the apps that are being built on top. Mm-hmm. So I don't think the market really understands this right now. I think we're still stuck in the infra la- layer. And everyone that launches a layer two right now, you know, their market cap goes up. But the people aren't really realizing that eventually this is going to be all compressed away. And it's really going to be the apps that bring the value for the layer ones and layer twos, layer threes. Mm-hmm. Yet to be seen. Yet to be seen. The FAP protocol thesis has been the right thesis for 10 years. So maybe that'll change at some point. But yeah, I agree. Cool. Any other questions? Uh, Kane has a good question. Is retail really in? Example, new people in the space, or is it the same people with more willingness to spend money? Do we think we definitely get a new retail class coming in this cycle? And from what? Okay, so there, there's actually a lot of debate on Twitter about this. Yes. There, there's people saying uh, retail is not here. There's other that are saying retail is here. I have some thoughts, but but I'm curious what you think. No, you go first. Okay. So I think the retail is actually here. And I know this by being really in the trenches, working with Pump.Fun, who helps people launch meme coins on Solana. And as all good founders do, they talk to the users. And I would talk to them to understand what they learn from their users. And it turns out that the people who are creating those meme coins on Solana are true retail. Like they're like truck drivers from Alabama, that type of retail. They're not crypto natives. I don't have data, large data to prove this, but anecdotally, I'm fairly confident that the people who are trading meme coins on Solana, at least, are true retail. Base is a different story. Base, 
I thought before this week, I thought it was crypto natives. I, I was actually very confident with crypto natives because the coins they launched were like a uh, dollar sign Normie, dollar sign DGEN, dollar sign, you know, some, 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 those names that crypto natives use. But this week, as of this week, the top tickers, top meme coins on base start to become more, less crypto native, more like pop culture. So I'm getting a sense that maybe there's retail that's coming from Coinbase to Base now. But that's a maybe. I'm more confident about Solana. I'm, I'm not sure about Base. Curious what you think. Okay. So it's really interesting. Um, it's as if retail's never left. What I mean by this is there's a large population of retail people that came in from all of the many cycles that just stay. They just stay. They continue buying, selling. They find their pockets and, you know, or they, otherwise they'll just leave it alone and they'll come back whenever the market's green. They'll get it a Coinbase notification. They'll start to come back and trade, mm -hmm. but they're dormant, right? Or they're hibernating is mm -hmm. what I call, what I, what I would call it. Mm -hmm. And whenever market pumps, they're back. And that also brings on more new people. So for now, like I think a retail has never left one. And that's why it may seem like why are the retail people in or not? It doesn't seem like it, but retail's here. And they've always been here. Two, they're more sophisticated than we think they are. Meaning that many of them, and I, I know this because I, I, I talk to retail people all the time and I ask them a lot of questions. And it turns out they're familiar using Uniswap. They're familiar using Jupiter. Jupiter and they're on crypto Twitter now. They actually also follow Ansem. <laughs> <laughs> of course. And, and they follow another guy named web 3 Uh huh. And I know this because I've asked many people and they get, they've given me these responses. Yeah. I, I talked to Webster Kwan, by the way. He, okay. He's, uh, he's, we should uh, bring him on our pod. We should. Yeah. He, he has a TradFi background who also understands the DGEN. Very it's rare. Combination. We should, we should bring him on. Yeah. And to me, I think, um, you know, it was as if you and I joined in 2013 and, you know, in 2017, is like our next cycle, right? Yeah. Like actual cycle, 2020, whatever, right? So I think that's where we are on the retail penetration side. Not saying, I mean, there's a good healthy amount, but more will come. I don't think the, the new flow, I haven't seen the new flow of people coming yet. It mm -hmm. seems to me it's just all the existing retail people got activated. That's what it seems like to me. Reactivated. Reactivated, like The sorry. retail that was here last cycle, they got reactivated. Yes. Um, new because are coming in, but they're not here yet. Like fully here yet. Coinbase is still the the Coinbase app. Yeah, is still two hundred something. Yeah, it's ranked two hundred something on on the app store. But I, I don't know if Coinbase app is a an, a good indicator anymore. Yeah, I think it's Phantom. I can see that. So I I think Phantom yeah. is. So the the cycle uh, we sell when Phantom becomes number one, on um, in in app store. Hundred percent. Phantom is the key indicator. Yeah, because it's the funnel for Solana. It's a funnel for Solana. And so once you get into like Solana shitcoining, you'll, you'll likely meet Ansem at the end of the day. Like, I mean, like, like if you're, <laughs> somehow all roads will lead to Ansem. Okay? All roads will lead to Ansem. And Ansem, he's open and he'll like, okay, let's go to base. People will go to base. They'll yeah. figure it out and they'll go to base. And I think that's what's happening. They will figure it out. Like if there's an ability to make money, you're just like what you and I talked about, which is like, buying our first Bitcoin, you wired money to figure this out, right? You want to get exposure to space, you bought Bitcoin, you wired money to Mt. Gox, and you, you got your Bitcoin, right? That's what you had to do. Yeah. Same thing with me, right? I had to figure it out. I, I mean, I got in right around the time Bitcoin, Coinbase launched easily with on-ramps, off-ramps. So it was pretty easy for me. But that's their battle, right? And so I think they'll figure out bridging and all of that. And those, the ones that are bleeding edge will make money. You know what just crossed my mind? There's about 1 million daily active addresses on Solana. Uh, and Solana is by far number one compared to the layer twos. Base probably went up a lot this past week, but Base is probably on the order of a few hundred thousand. Now, a lot of these active data active addresses are probably bots, mm -hmm. farming, etc. And now if you think about the number of followers that Ansem has, it's <laughs> Ansem has 300,000. Yeah. So maybe you're right. Maybe all the users on Bayes and Solana are following Ansem. 
Yeah, this is perfect, actually. That m- brings everything in full circle, which is the information side. There's information silos all across the world about crypto. Just like someone shilling Cardano to a Chinese community where that video went viral. Or when my friend told me that he read a, he watched a podcast where they talked about why Cardano is the future and why people are building on Cardano. And it comes back to YouTube. It comes back to all these silos, right? And eventually, like, Someone has to own that flow of information that can actually tell retail what coins are actually good to buy. And I think that's why I, I think Ansem kind of is the end all be all in the cycle, which is like people trust him. Uh, he's, you know, there's trust, there's quality, there's entertainment and all of that. And so people just somehow find him and they follow him. It's just something that I noted. You know, it's funny that people say there is no main character for this cycle yet. I think we already have one. Yeah. But it, Ansem is trying to, he does not want to be the main character. <laughs> yeah. There's no main character that ends up well. Yeah. It's mostly. Yeah. Hopefully he's all right. I was going to bring up another good point, but can't anymore. But uh, yeah. So um, I do think uh, there's an element of uh, dispersion of information that's being consolidated. And I think, you know, that's where the retail flow is going. Retail flow then will find opportunities in Solana, Base. And they could, those two chains could become the, the retail chains. But. I was thinking about one thing this morning, since you, you said the word dispersion. I was thinking this morning, uh, there's actually a lot of dispersion in the market, in crypto market, meaning uh, historically, in the last cycle, for example, everything went up or down at the same time. All the coins would go up together, all the coins would go down together. Yeah. But, but this cycle, if, if you follow Twitter, like a lot of people complain about the lack of, uh, like, why isn't there an alt season yet? Well, the fact of the matter is, if you, don't, if you haven't experienced the, uh, an alt season, you are just simply in the wrong coins. And so this, th- what's happening in this cycle is the different coins, they move independently of each other. Some do really well, others have been flat. Yeah. And I was thinking to myself why this is the case. And I have an interesting theory. I'm sure there are other people have thought about this as well, but my theory is actually really because there's too many coins. Yeah. In this cycle is, and, and those, there's orders magnitude more coins in this cycle than the last. And the, the, the attention is being fragmented. There's only so many players, but the number of coins they can buy is way larger compared to the historical average. So they simply cannot buy everything together. They have to focus on the subset. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I agree with that. I feel as if we um, we're becoming bigger and bigger crypto ecosystem. And um, there will be a point where you and I can't even talk about all the things that are happening in crypto. I mean, that's kind of getting to that point, right? Oh. Um, but yeah, eventually it'll be big enough where there's things that are happening in different parts of the world where we'll have no clue. And maybe crypto Twitter doesn't become a thing anymore, right? Like it's just global news. I don't know. It does certainly feel that way. Great. Um, I think we covered a lot. Well, um, thanks for listening in. Um, if you have any questions, thoughts, join our Telegram chat. Otherwise, we'll catch you soon. Thank you. As always, the views expressed in the Good Game podcast are personal to the speaker's and do not necessarily reflect the views of any other person or entity. Nothing here should be construed or relied upon as investment, legal, tax, or other advice. Thanks for listening to Good Game. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you next week.